Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey there, this is Dr. Tracy Gappin. I am a board-certified urologist, men's health expert, and epigenetics coach. And you can find me at theedgeblueprint.com. That's edgeblueprint.com. Or my homepage is drtracygappin.com. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hey there, this is Dr. Tracy Gappin. I am a board certified urologist, men's health expert, and epigenetics coach. And you can find me at theedgeblueprint.com. That's edgeblueprint.com, or my homepage is drtracygappin.com. And already I'm out of my depth, so I'm going to bring in an expert to help me out former uh, guest on the show and someone who I just think is, is changing the world for the better with uh, epigenetics as, as a means. So uh, we've got uh, Attila Haidu, the CEO founder of Stelvio Oncology uh, in on board to give me some idea of what the heck Dr. Dr. Gap is about to talk about. Uh, fellas, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Attila, good to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you. Thanks for the opportunity to to join again. And uh, I'm Attila Haidu. I'm the CEO of Celio Therapeutics, and we're developing novel therapies for glioblastoma using epigenetics. And glad to be here, Pete, again. And we've had a long history in the past. So always uh, interesting having conversations with you and look forward to this one with Tracy. Are you in Canada right now, Attila? Right now I'm in Canada, although we have um, our lab at Sanford Burnham Prevost Medical Discovery Institute in La Jolla, California. And also uh, J Labs company in, in La Jolla. Nice, nice. So we got Dr. Gappin sitting outside in his scrubs, relaxing in Florida with the birds in the background. I'm in Southern California and it's freezing at 62 degrees. <laughs> I've got a sweatshirt on and Attila's keeping warm inside in Canada. Hey, so let's talk about men's health and Tracy. I, I know that you've got the, um, you're kind of the whole gambit between, uh, how, how middle-aged dudes take care of themselves, but just in general men. So let's talk a little bit about what the heck epigenetic coaching is and all of it. Yeah, sure. So it, uh, as a, a urologist, as a clinical urologist in private practice, I see guys every day who uh, suffer with uh, men's health issues, um, specifically you know, low testosterone. Uh, they're starting to lose their edge, I call it. Um, they uh, lose their energy, have mental fog. Um, they're typically... Uh, obese, if not borderline obese, with some insulin resistance, and they're not taking care of themselves, and they have chronic inflammation, and um, they probably have some element of early onset vascular disease. But it's interesting what they come to me for is sexual problems, for sexual health issues, huh. and they come to me because you know they they're having uh, performance issues in the bedroom, and it's funny that forget the obesity, forget the diabetes, forget the other major health issues that they're facing they come to me for better sex. And so that's kind of how the, the conversation starts. But what it ultimately comes back to is that it's a whole body approach. And whether we're talking about uh, sexual performance, we're talking about uh, maximizing testosterone, maximizing, I like to say maximizing performance in, in, in the bedroom or the boardroom or beyond, it's a whole body approach. And it takes more than uh, just fixing a testosterone number uh, to get them there. Okay, so more than just a testosterone number, give us an idea, because I'm a layman for sure, about how epigenetics plays into this. Yeah, great question. So epigenetics, uh, to, to give a little bit of background about this so people kind of know where we're coming from, your genes, your genetics is, is basically uh, your DNA. And your DNA is the, the building block of, of everything about you. Every cell in your body has the exact same 46 chromosomes uh, that are composed of DNA. And that DNA determines uh, the function of each cell in your body. And it determines how you, how you function, how you, how you grow, how you live, your risk for cancer formation, your uh, ability to build muscle, your ability to uh, perform in, in any aspect of your life. And so DNA are the building blocks of you and who you are. But we, we used to believe that, that your DNA was your destiny and that, that you're set to uh, uh, develop a certain cancer at a certain age, you're set to be obese, you're set to have whatever diseases. We now know that that's not true, and that's where epigenetics comes in. So epigenetics means on top of or over or above your genes, and that means that specifically we can adjust the expression, we can alter the expression of your DNA, of your genes, 
um, by the environment. And that means lifestyle, specifically your nutrition, specifically your uh, sleep, specifically your ability to deal with and be resilient for stress, your fitness level. Um, the environment can also mean toxins that you're exposed to that may uh, uh, cause certain problems that we can talk about in terms of testosterone specifically. And so epigenetics is, is basically this environment around you that can drastically alter the expression of the genes in your body and produce a different outcome. And I'll give you a great example. There was a, a good study that showed that six months of, of exercise caused overexpression of 7,000 genes in a person's body. And so uh, simple lifestyle changes can have a dramatic effect. That's super interesting what, uh, what you're doing. And because you obviously play a big role in uh, overall men's health and you've got all these issues to deal with. You mentioned the, uh, the sexual interests, you mentioned men's health and how, how motivated are, are men in particular to, for example, monitor their PSA and, and, and change their lifestyle and have healthy habits and exercise regularly and, and, what, how do you tie epigenetics together with what you do and their overall motivation of improving your own uh, men's health? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I, I think the key comes down to um, bio-individualization or personalization of, of, of treatment. And what I mean by that is you're going to go to your doctor. Your doctor is going to tell you, hey, you need to eat more green leafy vegetables. You need to lose weight. You need to exercise. And that's fine. That sounds good and great. But in reality, how many people are going to do that? But what's very different about what I do, I, I look at things very differently. And that is I look at your genetics and I say, hey, look, based on your genetics, you're going to do better uh, with this particular nutrition plan. Um, I'll give you a great example. Uh, I, I have a client who uh, whose genetics showed that she, and this was um, actually, I'll tell you, it's my, my wife, but she's a great example. She was my, my first genetic client as I got into this realm. Her genetics showed that she does much better in terms of, of uh, metabolism and weight loss and building muscle with complex carb intake and lower um, protein intake. And she's an APOE4 carrier. That's a genotype that puts you at a, a much higher risk for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease with saturated fat intake. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, up to 11 to, to 15 times higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so she's a perfect uh, uh, a case and is a great example of how those particular genetics can help me guide the treatment plan for that particular client and, and adjust what they're doing. So a lot of guys like to do keto. They think that keto is the answer to losing weight and building muscle and burning fat. If a client had that particular genotype, the last thing I would want to do is put that client on keto to build muscle and lose fat. And so it comes down to, um, you, you bring up a great point that a lot of guys don't want to necessarily put the effort forth. They want the easy pill. They come to my office for you know a, the blue pill to help get their erections up. But in reality, when I can really individualize it, when I can personalize it down to their genetics and say, hey, look, your epigenetics show this. Nutrigenomics can help you by doing this. It makes it completely different, and it entirely changes the perspective where we're no longer looking to just eradicate disease and prolong death. I'm looking to actually promote wellness, and that's what it's really coming down to. When you're explaining all this, what I'm hearing, again, from my end of it is, and a lot what Attila is doing is, is we're not looking for these blanket diets or blanket cancer solutions in Attila's case, we're looking for a very specified approach to your specific middle-aged body and lack of energy kind of problem. Is this is this is Pete's specific problem. I need you to eat more donuts or whatever it's going to be, but also exercise more, do these types of activities. Is that, is that what yeah. I'm hearing you say? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're getting pretty, pretty darn close. Yeah, so it, it comes down to some basic general recommendations when it comes to, to, to um, health decisions, when it comes to nutrition and, and sleep and, and, uh, and fitness and so on. But there's so much more to that that really uh, when we can target individuals based on their genetics, we can really create a precise uh, individualized plan that fits them in particular. And, um, and that's what makes things really exciting now. So it's more precision medicine is it down to individualized uh, tr list sort of preventative goals? Is it so because prevention is uh, very interesting, and it seems that that's where medicine is heading towards more preventative, um, in sort of instead of treating a sick patient, you're preventing them from getting sick in the first place. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, we talk about this P4 medicine, this proactive preventative um, uh, medicine now, uh, precision-based medicine. This is exactly right, where we're no longer 
focusing on disease prevention or I'm sorry, on, on disease treatment, you know, the, the disease model is dying and where we're heading toward is really optimization. And I think optimization is the key word, whether it comes to uh, optimization from a, a, a mental standpoint, from a cognitive standpoint, when it comes to a hormone standpoint, a metabolism standpoint, um, you know, your gut health, everything is, is now really um, moving toward a state of optimization. And I think that's really the key. When you're talking about all these different optimizations things, like it's, um, yeah. you know, you can focus on, I've got to get my gut right. Oh, and I've got to make sure I take my vitamin regimen. And, and it, it's not a, a, I guess you would say holistic approach, but there's a problem where we have all these different things that we're trying to account for. And it's easy to not account for other things. How, how do you, when you deal in epigenetics, is it more of an inclusive, like, like if we get the base, is epigenetics kind of a foundational approach and then you can work on other specific aspects of your health and your, all the different things that we go through as we get older? Yeah, I, I would actually say epigenetics is, is more all encompassing. And okay. so um, it, it can, yes, it can be overwhelming. I think that the key is to really focus on, on individual clients and what their particular goals are and what they're looking to, to accomplish. And um, it, it's a work in progress. And so, you know, we don't just create a plan and say, here you go and, and read your genetics and say, this is what you should do and, and, and move along. It's really, I like to say, it's an intersection of genetics, epigenetics, and clinical precision medicine, where it, it all kind of uh, ties together. And uh, it, it's a moving target. We're always trying to optimize. We're always trying to improve. And, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of biometrics that we can use to monitor your uh, athletic performance, for example, and uh, your breathing, for example. And we can look to always be improving that as time goes on. And then when you're talking about improving all of these things and tracking all of these things, th that's great if the person is going to drink the water that you're bringing to them. But, but what about the habit forming, the positive habits and those things that they're trying to get done? It's, it's great to have the help, but how do, how do we get these habits built? <laughs> great question. It, you know, it, I think it all starts with mindset and I'm, I'm a, a, a big proponent of having the right mindset and, a lot of it is um, motivation. A lot of it is getting rid of your negative limiting beliefs. And I think a, a lot of guys, uh, once they can accomplish that, it changes everything. So a lot of guys may have a bad weekend. You know, maybe let's say they were out watching football and they ate wings and drank beer all weekend. Then Monday morning, they're like, oh, well, screw it. I've already kind of messed it up. I'm just going to have donuts now and, and forget it. And so it, it's teaching guys um, how to have the right mindset and, and kind of keeping them accountable. And so um, I, I'm in, from, uh, it's interesting. I, I, I call myself a coach. I'm a, I'm a physician. I'm a, a board certified urologist, but I find more importantly that I'm a coach because um, I'm providing some level of accountability. And I think that really helps. It sounds like you're heading towards uh, monitoring uh, global health. In other words, and specifically men's health. The, are you, are you looking at particular patterns that you're seeing with individuals? And is there any, is there any opportunity to take advantage of like, clusters or patterns of different people to to as you said optimize yeah i i would say that that there are definitely patterns i i think uh, it, it definitely uh, requires individualization because again you, your genetics dictate how to optimize you whether it comes to the nutrition i talked about whether it comes to sleep you know whether you respond to melatonin or not whether your circadian rhythm is this or that uh, from an athletic standpoint, whether you do better with aerobic versus strength training, um, from a hormone standpoint, how do you detox? And there are all these different genetics that we can look at to really um, uh, create a personalized approach. But bigger picture, you're talking about you know global men's health. It, I, I think the problem uh, is something that is universal in a sense, and there are some basic um, you know foundational things that we can look at. You know, our Western diet, there's so much sugar. There's so much refined sugar. There's so much processed uh, foods. It's causing overwhelming levels of insulin resistance, obesity, chronic inflammation, uh, which is associated with uh, a subacute or, or undiagnosed vascular disease. And there's certainly some element of cognitive decline that goes along with that. And that all leads to you know high high levels of estrogen, low testosterone, and other other hormone issues, uh, high cortisol. And we're exposed to estrogenics, you know, these endocrine disruptors that are all around us. Um, we know that there's estrogen in our water supply and our drinking water. Um, we know that there's, you know, in our water bottles that have BPA, which are, is leaching from the plastic into the water. Uh, we know there's estrogenics in um, our household cleaning products, in our laundry detergent. You know, if you have any perfumed um, household products, it, you're, you're absorbing it uh, through your skin from, from your detergent. Uh, 
from your um, soaps and your shampoos and your, and your deodorants. All these products we know have estrogenic in them. We know there's estrogenics in our food supply. You know, the meat, uh, unless you're eating grass-fed organic meat, a lot of the cows are eating these, these crops that are, um, that are full of pesticides and herbicides that we know are full of uh, estrogenic compounds. So getting back to this big picture, we are full of estrogens, we have chronic inflammation, we have insulin resistance, we have obesity, and we have low testosterone and sexual issues, which may be what's on the front, you know, above the surface, but underneath it is all these issues that are, I really think is a global problem because they're all interrelated. Yeah, that's where I was sort of heading with this because, um, as you know, with epigenetics, you can uh, take a, a simple blood uh, drop from someone and, and look at their epigenetic profile. And in, in some cases, uh, your patients will have multiple comorbidities. They're, they're going to have different issues. And um, because one of the things we're working on that's interesting is, is this whole uh, global health monitoring using epigenetic profiles, because for example, in, in um, let's look at Huntington's disease, which is obviously completely different than what you're doing, but it's a developmental disease. And there's some interesting data that shows that the epigenetic changes in these particular people occur uh, months, if not years in advance of their gene expression changes. Mm -hmm. What that means is we can actually um, monitor the health of individuals in likely hundreds of different disorders and track their changes throughout time and potentially prevent or intercept certain conditions from becoming a problem for patients even before they happen. So that's sort of what we're doing, um, not as a priority, but we, we've, we've shown in the past that we can actually take blood samples and, and, and uh, identify the, the epigenetic variability and and the, and the patterns that emerge that may cause someone to go on and develop a disease and and more importantly is you can through um, uh, mo the monitoring you can uh, let them first of all be aware that they could develop a disorder and secondly what options do they have available to them whether it's one of your approaches or whether it's a, um, a, a drug or something that's modifiable. With the both of you guys working together sort of from the same building block set, you're talking about uh, I've got a genetic proclivity towards Alzheimer's or whatever, and now my diet is putting more of the Alzheimer variable into my into my epigenetic mix, my soup, if you will. So, yeah. so I've got to – or – uh, in the case of uh, glioblastoma, you know, I'm I'm feeding the thing that may give me brain cancer. Is that am I getting that right? That's that's the way I I, I envision, um, and that's the way I would think that we're moving towards that direction. Is it's more imagine if you could um, prevent disease or intercept disease once you've embarked on that process, and there's a number of genetic. Uh, mutations that occur, for example, in developing cancer. And, and, and so uh, imagine if you could intercept the disease or prevent the disease from happening. And not only that, but if, if there was a personalized approach to preventing or treating, because I know when I, I, a, a long time ago, when I, <laughs> when, when I was with GSK, we were actually, um, we did a study with uh, Avidar, which is dutasteride, which is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which I'm sure you, you're familiar with Tracy, but we actually uh, uh, approached the FDA and, and, and asked them to approve uh, prostate cancer prevention with dutasteride. And eventually that, that didn't happen because there was, um, uh, there was a, a safety signal which um, didn't allow it to happen. But I think that that's one example in, in, in urology that I can think of where people have thought, well, we could start preventing this disease from happening before it gets there. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And, and there's a lot of uh, activity in, in this space around prostate cancer uh, when it comes to epigenetics, uh, genetic uh, profiling, and uh, looking at your, your risk of developing prostate cancer, for example, um, your, uh, your response to certain drugs, you know, for advanced prostate cancer, 
there are certain uh, genetics that we know will, will um, define your response to certain chemotherapeutic agents, for example, for advanced prostate cancer. So it's really exciting, and, and it's amazing how things are changing on a, on a weekly and monthly basis as, as we continue to learn more. How, there's so much here going on, and, and everybody's constantly telling me to buy their coffee because it's good for me, and their, their supplements, and you know, there's just so much information out there. But, like, legitimately, like, Tracy, you're actually a doctor, a for reals doctor, and not like a doctor of history who now wears some scrubs, but like an actual medical doctor. And then, Attila, you have decades working in the, in the pharmaceutical industry to give you this powerful scientific background. How do we sort out in general, like let's say nobody cares about Stelvio, no one cares about Dr. Gopin, you know, like but they just want to go their own route. But how do you tell what's real? There's so much. How do you sort out the snake oil from the actual solutions? Uh, great. Uh, yeah, so great question. I think the key is to recognize a couple of things. Number one, um, there's no one size fits all. You're not going to find some study that's going to tell you, ah, oh, I'm supposed to be eating keto or oh, I'm supposed to eat this or that. There's, there's not a one size fits all magic pill out there that you're going to find. Uh, there's not a magic medication you're going to find. There's not a magic formula. Um, there are some basic guidelines, but um, you need to understand that everyone's different and is going to respond different. That being said, you know, there are some, some basic building blocks when it comes to nutrition in terms of, you know, limiting your sugar intake, obviously be sure that you're, you're eating um, a healthy balance when it comes to, to fruits and vegetables, when it comes to eating, you know, uh, I, I typically recommend a Mediterranean diet, which is heavy on the monounsaturated fats, uh, the olive oil, uh, the uh, omega-3 fats like salmon. Um, I love avocado as well. And staying away from the, the, in general, trying to limit your, your saturated fats, like, you know, the cheese, the milk, the dairy, the, um, the, the meats, uh, the cheeses, as much as you can. Um, or if you do choose to eat those foods and focus on uh, grass-fed, organic, um, uh, farm-raised um, um, sources if you can. So those are general recommendations for you. But the, the key is, again, that one size fits all uh, uh, just doesn't uh, apply here. The other thing I want to really just briefly mention is the fact that, that studies, when you see a new, a new study that's published out there, whether it comes to a certain type of diet or a, a certain way of, of promoting health, be aware that, that, that centers are, are publishing studies for financial gain, and there's always an underlying motive. And so you need to be careful that when a new study comes out, they have to be somewhat shocking. They have to be showing something that's different that's never been said before. They don't get grants if, you, if they're publishing the same information that's already been put out there. So take every study that's put out there with a grain of salt and realize that um, you know, there's always a different perspective. And, and there's, there's sometimes a relationship between one thing and another, but to show causation is often very difficult. What, what is your thoughts on that also, Attila? Because I know you had something to say. Oh, yeah. I always have something to say. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Tracy makes a really interesting point because, I mean, you have all these diets. You probably remember the Atkins diet. Sure. You probably remember all these different diets that come out. But at the end of the day, it, the, the motivation is to sell books. And so and pharma companies obviously have motivation to to sell drugs. But what Tracy is talking about is is uh, of high interest to, to me because it's something that's that's very difficult to change as well because that's you're talking about lifestyle modification and you're talking about that. That's why I asked the first question about motiv motivation, Tracy, mm -hmm. is because, for example, if you're a man over the age of 50, how motivated are you to have a better diet? How motivated are you to to um, exercise? How motivated are you to improve the quality of your human relationships? And in the, the, the unfortunately, we're in a society where people depend on um, PDE5 inhibitors and they, they depend on Tadalafil and Sildenafil, and, and which are rectal dysfunction drugs, and, and versus, you know, get out there, um, do the grass grind, run up that mountain, and, and improve your relationships. And so, you know, like the, the the recent study that just came out about red meat causing cancer. I mean, like, it, you know, these things are in, in the, the agriculture, like the grain industry is putting studies out there that are saying, well, you know, grains are healthy. And then we're talking about keto diets, which, which is completely the opposite. So there's a number of different interest groups here that are that are um, pushing their product or trying to sell their book. And it's, as you said, Pete, you make a good point about, well, how do we tease this out and, and and to me it, it comes down to um, 
creating uh, some movement where consumers are empowered to take um, ownership of their own health. And um, because people want to know, well, what can I do to, to um, improve my, my lifestyle in, in, in the most time and cost effective manner? And that's not an easy nut to crack. And so obviously we're looking at it from, from um, novel therapeutics for, for glioblastoma, which is, is the um, treatment size. Although what our approach is doing is, is um, it's a new paradigm because instead of trying to um, kill cancer cells, what we're trying to do is, is induce them to differentiate into uh, non tumor cell, basically reversing cancer into normal cell type, which is again, is a, uh, a paradigm shift in, um, in treatment. But at the end of the day, I think um, if we can detect these types of things earlier, what, you know, not necessarily cancer, because that's, that's a different, um, but as I mentioned earlier with the, the neurodegenerative diseases or, or potentially even prostate cancer or something like that, you know, what, what can we do earlier to prevent, um, to monitor health? I think consumers are heading that direction where they're, they're wanting to monitor their own health through wearable technologies and devices. And, and then physicians are looking for, uh, not another quality of life study or not another novel therapy that they've got thousands of those things that they, I think they're interested in how can we help the patients help themselves and save time for, for the physician. Um, and that's sort of, I think a lot of that's going to be consumer driven. So um, what particularly interests me about Tracy's approach is this focus on testosterone and how powerful that is and how, Simply, as you mentioned, uh, eating like salmon, for example, um, those healthy fats uh, naturally raise testosterone levels. And there are ways that you can modify your diet by reducing red meat intake and eating more um, uh, omega-3 fatty acid type uh, foods like salmon. And there are obviously supplements that you can take to uh, um to, to help with that as well. And I think that's, uh, that's very interesting. I'm talking with Dr. Tracy Gappin here. You can go to his website at drtracygappin.com. That'll be in the show notes, of course. And on there, once you're there, you can take a survey and kind of get an idea of where you sit with the, uh, uh, w- with your testosterone level. And you can get started looking at, you know, the, what Tracy's doing in terms of how he's helping uh, his patients get in front of things. It seems to me, fellas, that, you know, a couple decades ago, maybe three or four decades ago, especially men, we would we would die off in our 50s because we didn't have great diets. We smoked. We had three martini lunches, and we've gotten better at uh, reducing those bad habits. But now, like, what's the next generation's version of that? You know, like, oh, you just can't smoke and, and drink all the time. Um, I go to the gym when I can because I'm getting older and I'm busy. Um, but what are, what are some of the things, what are just like the basic entryway things like, okay, it's too much to jump into epigenetics. I don't even know what the hell Pete's even talking about. I've got these penis enlargement pills that don't seem to be working. I just want something I can do today right now to start myself going in the right direction. Tracy, what's, what is, what is the, what are those one or two or three things that someone can just do and work on getting good at before they even jump full into the deep end of the pool? Yeah, sure. So I'll give you three little nuggets to kind of help guys get started. And and these kind of correspond with the three um, general uh, sections of of my my uh, coaching that I focus on. One is is nutrition. And the one easy thing that I can talk about is intermittent fasting. And a a lot of people have heard about intermittent fasting. It it has been somewhat of a fad lately, uh, but there's a lot of science behind it. And I, I think that it is a good place for guys to start. It, there are a couple ways of doing it. Uh, you can do the the, the 16 8 uh, cycle where you fast for 16 hours and eat in an eight hour window. Uh, you could fast a, a one or two days a week. Um, but I think that's something that, that guys can immediately start today. And um, I, I have a lot of guys who will do do nothing but that for the first week or two as they're kind of even even thinking about if they want to do any of, of my my program. And it, it, it kind of resets your body. It helps with autophagy, which is uh, your body's uh, uh, way of clearing out uh, bad, dead, old cells, uh, getting rid of old cells so there's more room for your newer, healthier cells. 
Um, it helps with uh, hormone metabolism. It helps with insulin sensitivity. Helps with a lot of different um, enzymes that have to do with your hunger and satiety as well. So I think uh, intermittent fasting is a good place to start. I think the second thing I'd focus on from a fitness standpoint is you got to get out there and do something. And a lot of these guys, it, it's really getting off your butt and making a decision, making a, you know, a mindset shift that it is important for you to uh, have, be able to have sex with your wife. It is important for you to be able to be present with your kids. It is important for you to be able to have cognitive uh, uh, function and, and be sharp mentally when you're in that, in the boardroom. And so, um, you, you know, the, it, it really starts with, with making these decisions. So when it comes to exercise, you just got to get off your butt and do it. And I like to talk about strength training, talk about interval training. And I tell guys uh, three days a week, 30 minutes a day, three days a week, start with that now. And that's kind of a, a good uh, baseline starting point. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. 30 minutes a day, three days a week, start with that now. And that's kind of a, a good uh, baseline starting point. The third one is, it, again, is mindset. And a, and a quick hack for mindset is I, I point to the fact that everyone's going to fail and you have to just get back up. And a, a good analogy I like to use for this is Tom Brady. You know, Tom Brady, he, uh, the Super Bowl last year, he fumbled away the end of the game. He fumbled away a chance for them to win. And what does he do? He gets back up and he plays the next game. And, you know, you kind of have to have to have a, a short term memory and forget about what has happened in the past. And a lot of guys have negative beliefs, negative mindset that they failed in the past. They failed yesterday. They failed at the last meal, for example. And so they just give up and quit. And so it's, it's overcoming the mindset. So intermittent fasting, get off your butt and avoid the, the limiting beliefs uh, would, would be the three easy nuggets that I can have you start with. Yeah, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks that have achieved a lot of success. And one of the things is, is just to be be as relentless as your problem is, you know, like, yeah, you're going to make mistakes. It's OK. Mistakes are going to happen. Yeah, you're going to fall off the wagon. It, the wagon will always stop. It will always let you get back on. You just have to keep after it. And if your problem is not going to give up, if old age is old age ain't quitting, like it's going to keep on coming. So the sooner yeah. you, you know, keep, the more you keep after it, the sooner you get after it. You know, that's if that's where your fight is, that's where your fight is. And that's where that, that's why I wanted to get into this part of it was you don't have to be a pro at this stuff yet. You don't have to be like, I only eat carrots on Tuesdays. Like, that's great. Get to that point later on. But for right now, know that the wagon will always stop and let you get back on. You can say, that was the weekend. I had wings and donuts. And now we're going to get back to it, you know, and, and heck, just get back to the things that, you know, what are the most basic things? You know, I try to, uh, I try, my goal is to eat two salads a day for meals or some kind of vegetable based meal just because uh, it's, it's a good starting point. And if I do it three days out of the week, that's cool. You know, I've eaten a lot more vegetables than I might've otherwise. I, I love vegetables, but apparently I suck at eating them often enough, <laughs> but, uh, but that's kind of where I try to do it. I try to get out and I try to walk, you know, five days a week, you know, for about an hour, it doesn't always happen, but at least I'm keeping track of, of what I am doing and, and when I'm not doing it so that I can force myself, like, here's my hour long window. Let me at least walk for 45 minutes today because I've got a show to record or, or whatever it is. We, we really can do those kinds of things to establish these good patterns. And, and unlike, unlike bad habits, good habits are, are a little tougher to start. It's uh you know, it's, it's for sure a challenge. What, let me ask you this. I want to, I want to look at this part of it. We talked a lot about men's health and there's a lot of male audience members, but I don't want to leave behind the ladies. How does epigenetics, like what, what are the impacts for them? Obviously they have the same kind of makeup, but give me an idea of, of what the ladies uh, need to do. I, I would say that there is not a huge difference when it comes to the underlying basic foundation of, of your health, when it comes to nutrition, stress, um, reduction or management, uh, when it comes to, to better sleep, uh, when it comes to hormone balance, when it comes to fitness. I think for women, um, a lot of it ends up being hormone balance. And I think there are a lot of things that we can look at from an epigenetic standpoint um, in terms of balancing hormones, in terms of helping with detox. 
Um, but a lot of the rules apply to women in, in a similar manner. Yeah, I was uh, actually interested in what you said about the fasting and the fitness and the um, mindset. I mean, I think those are three powerful things uh, that people can change. And I agree, it's the same for, for women. And I think one of the additional challenges uh, that um, I see in, in, in women is obviously they're the ones that are um, childbearing and they're the ones that have gone through those changes, which... When I look at my own wife, for example, uh, we were uh, dating. We would go on these uh, bike tours in Mexico, and she was um, a very, very fit. And over time, obviously, when you have three kids, it really changes your um, your mindset and your ability to even get out and exercise. And I, you know, I honestly don't see my wife fasting because she's she gets hypoglycemic very quickly. <laughs> so she would uh, she, she doesn't. Uh, uh, do any of that and she just doesn't have time for so what are your what are your thoughts tracy on on for example it's it's almost goes against fundamental human nature to fast first of all and do we have the time to go out and exercise and the third thing about the mindset again that is that's pretty powerful stuff um but for for for, for women it's it's I, I would think it's a lot harder and a lot of them resort to um giving getting the money makeover yeah. And because it's just, you know, they've like my wife, she had three kids and it, it, uh, um, it changes your body. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's tough uh, for, for busy moms. You know, my I have a, a three year old and a five year old at home and, uh, you know, they're my why. But my wife is home with them on, on a daily basis. And I, and I see the struggle. I see how tough it is. And it's tough to make time to, to exercise and, and how do you eat right and how do you, you take care of yourself? And, and I think it's baby steps. I think it, it's finding little wins. I think it's finding uh, things that you can do. You know, a lot of the exercise stuff I talk about, um, I, I have a, a, a exercise programs that I've created for, for men and women to use as well um, that you can do with just household items and do it from, from home with body weight. And so you don't need to go to a gym. You don't need to hire a trainer and spend hours at the gym. You can do it really, you know, 30 minutes a day you could do some interval training. Uh, you could do some strength training with, with just maybe even just some dumbbells and, and not much more than that. Um, in terms of, of the nutrition piece, I think it's, I think it starts with awareness. And I think again, it's, it's an individualized approach and in knowing what, what, you know, what nutrition plan is going to work for you. But um, I'll give you a great example. Broccoli. So fresh broccoli is one of the best foods when it comes to from an epigenetic standpoint, broccoli has been shown to from an, at a, at a genetic level, change your risk of developing cancer. Okay. Just eating broccoli. So half a cup of broccoli a day, and it needs to be fresh broccoli. If you cook it, um, you need to chop it up and wait about 45 minutes before you cook it. But uh, fresh broccoli is better uh, to, to, to get the, the benefit from it. It's, it's knowing little things like that that you can, can take advantage of and find the little wins throughout the day that kind of get your mindset going so that you, you feel that you're making a positive change. But, but it's hard. It's hard for busy moms. I, I yeah. definitely would agree. Stuff, yeah. When you talk about making some of these changes, let's say I'm going to, I'm going to have a daily dosage of broccoli, you know, I'm going to have raw broccoli. I love broccoli, so that's not a problem. Right. But what, um, you know, let's say I start doing the, the three to four times a week, 30 minutes of exercise, doing some interval, you know, I, I start to do these things. When, when do you think like I'll start to feel better as a, as a, you know, swollen, overweight, undersexed, <laughs> middle-aged man? When do I, uh, when does the tide start to first turn? I see guys notice a tremendous difference within a week when it comes to their overall sense of well-being, when it comes to their, their just mental clarity, when it comes to, to their, their focus. That comes with getting rid of sugar, and that comes with the intermittent fasting. Before you, you know, and then the ex adding on three days of exercise as well. Within a week, I have guys tell me they feel a huge difference, and it creates a, a positive, you know, a, it's a positive cycle where now they feel – confidence because they've made some progress and that motivates you to want to do more and so instead of being in that vicious ugly cycle of, of self-doubt and you know negative limiting beliefs that you can't do it and th there's no hope now you have found the hope you found that light at the end of the tunnel and it can start getting you going and, and moving forward and then is there a a first wall that we're, like it's great like i've done this for two weeks but like, well you know and then i had to go to that wedding and then i had that pie and you know yeah. thanksgiving showed up when's when's the first wall that we need to be aware of so we can like build things around that like okay thanksgiving is the day off thursday we're gonna schedule a hike or what when's that first point 
Well, it, I, I would I would first say that that you need to live. You know, it's all about uh, at some point quality of life, and you know this isn't supposed to be torture. And I tell my guys that the, 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 you're not, you're not on a diet. This isn't a diet. This is a, a, a health plan, and this is to optimize your life. And you're going to go eat at Thanksgiving. You're you're not going to you know you're, you're not going to be a good boy on on that day, and that's okay. It's getting back up and keeping going. And so you're going to hit a wall though by just doing those simple basic things. And that's where I come in, where I feel like. Everyone needs a coach. They need to have an individualized perspective so they can know exactly what things should they be doing. It may require testosterone replacement. It may require supplements. It may require, again, a particular diet. Um, we haven't talked much about sleep, but there's a lot of uh, intricacies and nuances when it comes to optimizing your sleep that uh, comes down to an individualized level as well. And so you're going to hit a wall, I'd say probably you know month three or so, where you feel like you're doing all these good, healthy things and making some progress. But then it's like, okay, what now? What do I do now? How do I move forward? And, and that's where the individualized approach has to come in. Yeah, no, it, uh, I find it very um, <laughs> fascinating. Um, and so I think one of the things I've personally done and, and I know has um, benefited me is, is these, this concept of high intensity intervals. Because when you say interval training, I mean, you think of, you know, you go to the gym, you see people on the treadmill and they're, they're not even sweating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so they're they're there mostly because they got their Lululemon on, and you know they. Uh, are... Hey, don't knock the Lululemon. I love there. It's so com- I'm sorry. Go on. It's so comfortable. Go. Oh no, I I, I have Lululemon. I uh, I met Chip Wilson the other day, so I I I, I, oh, nice. uh, nice. I read his book, uh, uh, Little Black Stretchy Pants. Uh, re- I would recommend it. But but um, what are your thoughts on on high intensity? Well, I have a number. Of, well, probably three questions. What are your thoughts on high intensity intervals? Uh, number yeah. two, number two, as one ages, our heart rate drops uh, every year, I think, by about a beat per minute. And what's your thoughts on strength training to compensate for the lower heart rate? Because obviously you want to increase uh, lean muscle mass, um, which I think a lot of people, are, especially women, are afraid of because I think if they do strength training, they're going to get bulky and bigger. So yeah. there's a mindset there. And then number three, um, my understanding is that testosterone is one of the most well, is the most potent fat burner that we know of. So how do we raise testosterone? Three great questions. Number one, um, you're exactly right. I have a lot of guys who will tell me that I ran on the treadmill for 30 minutes every day last week, and and I hate that. I hate just running, jogging on the treadmill. Um, I'd rather you almost do nothing than just run on a treadmill for 30 minutes. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm kidding, but um, you need to do interval training. Uh, you need to do strength training. When it comes to high-intensity interval training, absolutely, it doesn't matter whether you're you're on a sled, whether you're doing weights, whether you're doing whatever, you need to be doing intervals um, to get the maximum benefit. Because just just walking or jogging on or running on a treadmill um, is not going to, uh, in general, be the best for you when it comes to optimizing your testosterone. Um, number two, strength training. Um, I have guys in their 80s who I have doing uh, weight. Uh, lifting strength training. Um, there's several studies that have shown even in uh, geriatric clients that there is a huge benefit and that everyone should be doing strength training. I'm not talking about going out and killing yourself, but, uh, but you need to be adding some weights. You need to be building muscle because that's what's going to help you in terms of burning fat. It's going to help you uh, maximize testosterone. It's going to keep your whole body healthy. So uh, whether it's a woman, whether it's an old person, you're exactly right. You're not going to become Arnold Schwarzenegger. You're not going to become a huge beefcake by by lifting weights two or three days a week. But it's going to provide huge benefits, and everyone, everyone, everyone should be doing strength training. Um, third question: maximizing testosterone. That's a, a a complex answer, but in general, it comes down to um, a lot of lifestyle things that we've talked about. It comes down to optimizing nutrition. You know, a lot of guys try to do keto or they try to do low fat diet, and you need you need to really be sure you focus on the right macro ratio, make sure that you're getting enough carbs, make sure you're getting enough of the good healthy fats to support testosterone production in your body. Um, number two, sleep. Sleep is is uh, one of the biggest problems I see in, in middle-aged guys where they're sleep deprived and they get five, five and a half, six hours of sleep and they think they're fine. And and, and every guy who gets six hours swears that they're fine and I can swear that they're not. And, <laughs> and so low uh, sleep deprivation has been directly linked to low testosterone and um, uh, I would definitely focus on that as one of the, the major things to, to work on. Fitness as well, strength training and interval training have both been shown to have a really profound impact on uh, testosterone levels. And then it comes down to more of a bio-individualized approach at that point. 
Um, a, a lot of guys do need prescription therapy, you know, including uh, testosterone and other medications. Um, but but I, I really take that on, on an individual basis. A quick aside, it, you'll see these testosterone clinics are at every corner now where you can go and, and, and get a testosterone shot for 49 bucks. And I, I think it's, I honestly think it's a joke. I think that uh, it's so much more than just getting a testosterone shot. And that's kind of the, the, the cheap, easy uh, band-aid to a bigger problem. And I think that uh, some guys may legitimately need it, but most guys need a full whole body assistance approach to optimizing them. Man, that's awesome advice. Uh, Cause you know, you always want to take that magic uh, pill, but yeah. it turns out diet exercise, you know, a good program is going to get you most of the way there. So uh, it's, um, it, you know, it's good news. I can stop worrying about the, <laughs> the testosterone clinic on the corner. Uh, tell us one more time where folks can find you, and, and we'll, uh, we'll let you get back to your lovely life in Florida. I uh, appreciate it. Yeah, my website's uh, drtracygaffin.com. That's uh, D-R-T-R-A-C-Y-G-A-P-I-N.com. And find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Yeah, yeah, and for sure do. He wants you guys to talk to him. He wants to be involved. He wants to, you know coach and get you on in the right direction and then uh, attila throw out your stuff too because what you're doing is incredible also i mean if i can be looking good and then beat cancer when it comes because of the both of you being in my life that's that sounds like a good deal so let everybody know how to find stelvio oncology sure so we we, we do have a website uh, stelvio-oncology.com and we're also on uh, facebook and twitter and linkedin all righty perfect and uh, you you guys are right. That intermittent fasting does make a difference. When I actually do it, it uh, it almost instantly makes me feel like I'm accomplishing something that isn't that hard to do. And I'm just so much more aware that I actually will survive the day if I don't have that sandwich at 10 o'clock at night, you know? It, it's funny, like, if my uh, – I always say, like, my stomach is such a baby. Like, if my ankle is screaming mad and in pain – you know, I'm like, man, whatever, I guess I'll just limp today, you know, and I won't put any pain pill in my mouth. I just won't because I'm stubborn, right? But the moment my stomach thinks it might be hungry, I'm jamming food in my mouth. So <laughs> the intermittent fasting thing definitely helps me focus on I, I actually will survive. I've got plenty of stores built up, and uh, and, and I'll make it through. Um, thanks, fellas, so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I, I know that there's a lot of us out there that are trying to figure out how to be healthier and, you know, there's a lot of crazy advice out there. That's why I wanted to have two guys that are very smart in epigenetics get out there and help us understand that there are very specific things we can do specifically for us on top of that. And uh, I, I appreciate what both of you guys are doing for all of humanity because, you know, we need your help. and We need your guidance. So thank you. You bet. You bet. Glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Pete. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Thanks, Tracy.